Hi everyone, I'm Robbie Beaver, and welcome to the first Collodion Chat video. So these are not going to be a series in the sense that my Collodion Basics videos were. Um, this is more of just what I'm calling kind of a set of random one-off videos that I want to make about different Collodion topics from time to time. So this first one is going to be about one of my favorite subjects, not just in wet plate, but in photography in general, and that is artificial light, specifically using strobes. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning about some of the kind of background information about strobes in general and why you might want to use them. If you're already really familiar with lighting and lighting equipment, and you're just interested in kind of wet plate specific information, you're going to want to probably skip forward maybe a half to two thirds of the way through this video to where I'll just talk about the specific types and models of strobes that I like to use for wet plate. But for everyone else, I want to start out with a general primer on artificial lights and strobes in particular and why you'd want to use them. And I'm going to start with that question, why strobes? Because uh, I think that's a question that doesn't get asked frequently. A lot of, right, so people do ask a lot of questions about strobes in clothing groups and forums. You know, which ones should I get? How powerful do they need to be? What modifiers can I use? You rarely see the question, why strobes? And I think a lot of people have kind of a default answer in mind for that, which may seem obvious. And what a lot of people think strobes are for is basically when you can't use natural light. They're for shooting indoors or in the cold season, or therefore shooting at nighttime, or if something is moving too fast to stop it on a wet plate. And that kind of core idea that artificial light is just sort of a substitute for natural light, I think it's a really unfortunate idea, and it's an idea that lies at the root of a lot of the distaste that some people have kind of reflexively towards artificial light and artificially lit photos. We can think about, you know, I think the first step to being successful in using artificial light is to just take that idea and discard it. You shouldn't be thinking about artificial light as a substitute for natural light. You should be thinking about it as its own thing, um, you know, as a unique and distinct tool that opens up a whole new set of creative possibilities for you. When you view it as a creative tool, as opposed to just a stand-in for something that could be better if you had access to it, you're going to have a much better chance of success. You know, I think pretty much as a rule, if you set out to do something with the idea that you're not going to be able to do a good job at it, that prophecy is probably going to fulfill itself. If you view what you're doing with artificial light as a unique creative opportunity and something to be taken seriously and learned and studied, you can get excellent results. So the thing about natural light is that it's very, very familiar to all of us. You know, everyone watching this video, in the near term at least, was born on the planet Earth. We all grew up here. We're all extremely familiar with the sun. It's there every time we go outside. And so Pretty much everything the sun can do, we have seen, because it only does so many things. It rises, it sets, it casts shadows, it gets obscured by clouds or other objects, and occasionally the moon eclipses it. What that means is that if you take a photo with natural light, it is pretty much by default going to fall into the realm of our understanding of light, um, by which I mean, you know, if you take a person and you set them outside and you take a picture of them, even if you have no knowledge of lighting, no idea how to do photography, you're just pointing at a camera at someone taking a snapshot outdoors. What you're going to end up with, you know, it may not be a great photo. It may be harshly lit. It may be poorly exposed. It may have garish shades to it. But the one thing that it will almost never be is alien, right? A photo taken under natural light is going to fall at some level into the realm of things that we're used to seeing. So this puts kind of a floor on how bad a photo can be with natural light. With artificial light, you don't have that restriction. And that is, in my opinion, what's really wonderful about artificial light, but it can also enable you to create some horrifically bad images. You know, you can use artificial light 
to create images that are not only poorly lit, but they're poorly lit in a way that we have no instinctual understanding of in our day-to-day -day interactions with the objects around us. We can make photos that don't just look bad, they look bad in completely alien and unfamiliar and just deeply ugly ways. But that's the bad side of artificial lighting, right? And I don't think that it makes sense to judge any creative tool by the worst work that you can possibly do with it. You should judge it by the best work that you can possibly do with it. And artificial light can not only create images that look just as good as the images you would create with natural light, but they can also enable you to create images that you simply wouldn't be able to do with the sun, with its fairly limited set of properties that we have no way to change. So, you know, you could look on the internet and you can find a million different wet plate photos that are very poorly lit with strobes. And you can look at those and you can get very down on the idea of artificial light. But you don't have to make plates like those, right? You can learn to use artificial light well. And you could look around and you could find the smaller body of exceptional work that has been done with artificial light. And you could take that as inspiration and really learn how to light and make your own work stand up to that quality, which I think should always be our goal. So the first step to learning to use artificial light with wet plate is learning to use artificial light, period. You know, if you're not already familiar with lighting, I would actually recommend if you have a digital camera, using that to get a feel for light to begin with. Um, because a good set of strobes for collodion is going to be expensive. And it's just a lot easier to get started learning how to light with, you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of speed lights than it is spending potentially thousands of dollars on, say, a Speedatron outfit. If you're just learning to light for the first time, I highly recommend the, the, the Lighting 101 series by David Hobby on his blog Strobist, which I will link to. That'll give you a really good sense of how to do basic off-camera lighting with small flashes, which you can do for a relatively low price. Now, if you get through that and you're looking for something more advanced, uh, there's a book that I highly recommend called Light, Science, and Magic, which is going to cover basically all the fundamentals of light and how it works, and it'll walk you through lighting just about any situation you could find yourself in, including really tricky topics like lighting glass or metal and other kinds of highly reflective or transparent surfaces. So, learn to light first, and then once you know how to light, move on to wet plate specifically. And now that we've covered that kind of introductory why artificial light subject matter, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about strobes more specifically, why I like them, and why you might want to use them in your photography. Now, if you're brand new to photographic lighting, let's talk a little bit about what strobes are and why you might want to use them versus any other form of lighting equipment. To begin with, I want to define two words, flash and strobe. So you'll hear these used interchangeably and they mean effectively the same thing, but they have different connotations. So in either case, you're referring to some kind of a photographic flash. But usually when someone uses the word flash, they're talking about what we call a speed light. So this is a small, usually battery powered unit that you're going to generally see in use on top of a camera mounted to its hot shoe. And that's not the only way you can use speed lights. Um, it is actually pretty common nowadays to use them off camera, but that's the general type of flash unit that you're going to have come to mind when someone uses the word flash. If someone says strobe, they're probably talking about a bigger, uh, frequently AC powered light unit that will typically be used in more of a studio setting. But those are just kind of guidelines. Strobes are flashes and flashes are strobes, and the two words mean essentially the same thing. And that is a light that operates by taking a steady stream of electricity from either a battery or AC power, and instead of Instead of sending the electricity directly to a light bulb to illuminate a scene the way a constant light would, the electricity is stored in a device called a capacitor, which is 
very similar to a battery, but it has a lower capacity and it operates much more rapidly. So what the capacitor in a flash allows it to do is to charge up current for several seconds, potentially even the greater part of a minute with larger flash units. And then all at once, it dumps all of that power into a flash tube, which is essentially just a special light bulb that burns at an extremely intense level for a very short period of time. The effect of this is that flashes or strobes produce a light that is very short and very bright. Why is that important? Well, first of all, it's fast. You know, this is especially attractive in wet plate where, you know, a natural light exposure may take several seconds, even in sunlight, whereas a strobe dumps its entire charge in a fraction of a second. Sometimes, you know, on the longer end, it may take a hundredth to a two hundredth of a second. Some very fast ones can operate in thousandths of a second. So this enables much less static poses. You know, I know some people are very into using uh, head braces and posing chairs and very traditional posing so they can have a subject hold a pose for an extended period of time. Personally, that's not really my style. I enjoy being able to pose subjects in ways that they couldn't necessarily comfortably hold through an entire natural light exposure. And strobes enable me to do that. The other big thing, of course, is the power. And the sheer intensity of a flash tube during the brief duration that it's on is staggering. You know, using even a small battery-powered flash unit, you can easily overpower the midday sun. Now, you can't do it for long, only a small fraction of a second, but if that's as long as your exposure lasts, it doesn't really matter. In wet plate terms, that is important because for one thing, it just makes it more convenient. You know, a lot of us use barrel lenses that don't have shutters in them. And so if you're operating inside, strobes allow you to work without a shutter or a lens cap. You know, the interior lighting in any room that I've ever worked in is just so dim that it doesn't have any effect on a plate in the time it takes me to pull the dark slide pop the flash and put the dark slide back in. I just leave the lens wide open the entire time and I don't worry about the ambient lighting. But more importantly, very bright strobes enable you to do more flexible things with your lighting. So the more power you have, the farther away from the subject you can get your light and the bigger and the more inefficient modifiers you can use on your flashes. So while a, uh, a smaller strobe may only work, you know, with say a bare reflector, which may give you a very harsh look. A more powerful one could potentially give you, um, you know, the ability to use larger soft boxes or octa boxes or similar modifiers to create a really soft and kind of conventionally pleasant portrait. Now, the question then becomes how much power do you need for wet plate? And in my opinion, this is a lot like asking how many horsepower should you get in a power tool? I think the answer is you should get as much power as your budget and the space that you have available to work with will allow. The reason for that is that, you know, it's not necessarily just about meeting what you perceive as your immediate needs. You know, you also want to leave yourself room to grow and to fulfill whatever needs or desires you may develop later on down the road as you continue to experiment and to grow in your photography. So the thing about wet plate is that there's really no such thing as too much light when it comes to strobes. You know, it's a very slow medium and even the most powerful strobes you can get your hands on are still going to get too dim if you back them off far enough. You know, there are lighting styles that I really like to use for digital that I simply cannot do with wet plate because no one makes a powerful enough strobe, right? Um, you know, something I love to do with digital is to take a giant six foot wide parabolic umbrella, put a diffuser on the front of it and use it as a fill light. It's gorgeous, it's unbelievably soft and I can back it up way across the room and it still looks great. But I can't do that with wet plate. Um, you know, whereas I could do it with a fairly small strobe on digital, 
I cannot get my hands on a bright enough light to do it with wet plate. So however much power you're able to afford and get your hands on, I promise you, if you try hard enough, you will find a way to use it all. Um, that being said, you don't have to go to the absolute top of the line if your budget doesn't permit. So that's, that's a brief description of strobes, uh, why you might want to use them. And before I go into the specifics of different types of strobes, I would like to just take a moment to look at uh, a piece that I did last year. Uh, this is a triptych of 8x10 tin types. And these are my favorite plates that I think I've ever made. And I like to use them as kind of a, kind of a, you know, a case in point for why I love strobes so much. Because this image would have been virtually impossible to create with art, or sorry, with natural light. You know, what I have here are two completely different scenes with the same subject and camera position. All right, one is bright field, one is dark field. And I wanted to combine the two scenes into one plate using a half dark slide for one of the plates. So to do this, I had to not only be able to set up this very specific look that would have been extremely difficult to pull off in either way with natural light, but I also needed to be able to very rapidly change between the two. So to do this, I used one strobe with a big soft box for the background, and I had a set of cardboard masks that I used to switch between the light and the dark view. And I also had two separate strobes uh, with grids on them to put very tight spots on the light, shooting from opposite directions, right? One to backlight the flowers and one to highlight the flowers from the front, uh, depending on which scene I was shooting. Now you could conceivably, you know, using a, a combination of maybe mirrors and a rotating table, pull this off with natural light, but it would be a very difficult undertaking and if you want to do what, or sorry, still lifes with this kind of complexity on a regular basis, you know, it just really, really helps to have uh, some sort of artificial light source to do it with. In particular, I think strobes work really well. And so let's go ahead and talk about the specific types of strobes and what you might want to get them for. All right, now that we've covered the basics of strobes in general, Let's talk about the specific types of them and which ones you might want to get for your wet plate photography. Now, strobes come in basically three different flavors. Now, there may be exceptions and hybrids and units that blur the lines, but they all fall for the most part into three categories. And we'll, we'll rank them by kind of their size and power. So at the very low end of the size and power scale is the humble speed light. These are battery powered units. They generally get used on top of a camera and they're not very powerful. You know, typically they'll come with say four to six AA batteries and they emit a respectable flash. You know, they're very useful for digital, but you're not gonna get a long way in wet plate with this. In fact, I would go so far as to say that for wet plate purposes, a speed light is basically worthless, you know. You could potentially get an exposure with it if you just kind of stick it right in someone's face, but it's going to be unbelievably harsh and it's an extremely limited use case. So for what plate purposes, I just wouldn't really consider speed light strobes. Now the next category of strobe, moving up the scale, is the monolite. And I don't have any examples handy to show you. But a monolight is, in a lot of senses, just a bigger version of a speed light that typically has an external power source. So like a speed light, a monolight has the flash tube and the capacitor all condensed into one package. This makes them very convenient because you can just plug one in and start shooting. Or in some cases, you can even get them nowadays with batteries built in. So you just charge it, you take it out, set it on top of the light stand, and it works. This is the key strength of monolights, but it's also their key limitation. Because the thing is that you can only make a monolight so powerful before it just gets too big to reasonably fit on top of the light stand and be used in actual practice. So are monolights useful for wet plate? or what will they get you, you know? 
And the answer is yes, they, they are and can be useful. They won't get you as much as some higher power units might, but that doesn't mean they're worthless. So on the low end of a monolite, or sorry, on the low end of the monolite spectrum, you'll find units that might range in, you know, say the two to five or six hundred watt second range. And I guess I should I should cover what watt seconds are before we go any further. So the, the power output of strobes, whether monolites or otherwise, is generally measured in watt seconds. Not watts per second, watt seconds. So a watt, right, is a rate of energy transfer. It represents one joule of energy being transferred or used per second. So a watt second is one watt's worth of energy transfer over the course of one second. So a watt second is one joule of energy consumed. And in fact, in some countries, it's common to market strobes by joules instead of watt seconds, and the two units mean the exact same thing. Uh, you can compare those numbers directly. There's no conversion between them. In America, we just use watt seconds for some reason, even though it's kind of a weird, weird rating. So watt seconds are not a perfect way to compare strobes because they don't measure the amount of light that the unit puts out. They measure the amount of power that it consumes. So you can imagine that a very inefficient light could potentially consume a great deal of power without putting out very much light at all. And a very efficient light might consume little power but produce a lot of light. So there is some ambiguity there. They're not great for doing direct apples to apples comparisons between different brands with similar outputs. However, at a gross level, they are useful enough for basic comparisons. So to, to go back to monolites, right, on the lower end, you'll get monolites that have potentially a few hundred watt seconds of power. And, you know, in my opinion, I would say the absolute minimum you should be looking at is a light with at least 500 to 600 watt seconds of power output. Now at that level, you're not going to get much. Um, that will give you enough power to do portraiture comfortably using bare reflectors, but that's going to be a very harsh, you know, a very contrasty look, which can be great in some settings, but it's not considered, you know, kind of conventionally attractive portraiture. If you want to do general purpose portrait settings, you, you, you usually want to have some kind of modifier on the light to increase its effective size and soften up the look a little bit. With monolites in that kind of 500 to 600 watt second range, you know, you could potentially use a silver umbrella. I've seen people do it successfully. You know, you're going to need a fast lens and fresh chemistry. And I think that's a caveat to all of this. You know, you should consider the guidelines that I'm giving here to assume that you're using a lens in, we'll say, at least the F4 range, and you have fresh chemistry, fast floating, and good developer. Um, those are going to be prerequisites to any successful strobe exposure. So, you know, that kind of mid-range um, monolight, you can potentially use them with silver umbrellas, maybe a white shoot-through umbrella if you get it in close. And that's not my favorite look in the world, but it works, you know, it's not a bad look. So if you're, if you're really looking for something that will just get you a usable portrait at the best possible budget, you may want to look at that kind of category of monolite. Um, you know, before I started shooting wet plate, I had a set of Paul C. Buff Einstein monolites, and those clock in at about 640 watt seconds, and I love those things. You know, they're, they're very handy lights, they had a really convenient remote control system. Uh, the only reason I got rid of them was because they just weren't powerful enough for wet plate. So something in that range could work. Don't highly recommend it, but it's doable. Now monolites do get higher power than that. Um, I think the very highest end of monolite power is going to top out around like 1200 to 1300 watt seconds. Um, for instance, the Paul C. Buff um, White Lightning X3200 
is pro would probably be my go-to if I were looking for a model light for wet plate. I think that's a 1300 watt second unit. And at that level, you know, you can do a lot. Not everything, but a lot. You know, you can pretty comfortably use a beauty dish for single or potentially even multiple person portraits. It might get a little bit iffy if you want to put a grid on the beauty dish, but even that might work. Um, but white beauty dish, I think, would definitely work at that watt second rating. Using a, an umbrella would be fine. You know, using soft boxes at that level is going to be pretty iffy, though. Maybe a small soft box if you take the internal baffle out and get it very close to someone. But if you want to use bigger modifiers and you want to get them farther away from your subject, you're really going to want to stretch beyond what you can do with monolites. So that will have you looking at kind of the next category of strobe, which is the pack and head system. So, while a monolite puts all of the flash guts into a single unit that you mount together on the light stand, with a pack and head, the capacitors and the flash bulb are no longer co-located. With pack and head systems, you have power packs which connect to AC power or a battery and they charge up to make the flash. And you have separately these flash heads which simply consume the power output by the pack and they create a very, very bright flash. Now the nice thing about the heads on a pack and head system is that they're very light. You know, compared to a monolite, this is tiny. Um, and the reason that we can have these very small flash heads on the pack and head system is because the bulk of the system that's doing all the work is in this pack, which just sets on the ground somewhere. So what's in the head is basically just the flash tube and some fans and whatever other electronics are necessary to make it all work. Pack and head systems can get very, very, very bright. So monolites kind of top out at 1300 watt seconds. Uh, with a pack and head system, you can easily get up into multiple thousands of watt seconds. So this head in particular can do 4800 watt seconds. This is basically two stops brighter than a Paul C. Buff White Lightning X3200 and two stops buys you a lot. It gives you the ability to use bigger modifiers to potentially back your lights farther away. So, you know, this is, I would say, kind of the ideal range that you want to be in if you're doing wet plate portraiture on a regular basis with strobes. You know, a pack and head system with power to spare is going to give you the ability to do more creative lighting work, and to just more comfortably work with your lights, even if, for instance, you don't have access to as fast of a lens or if your chemistry is starting to age. Now, which pack and head system should you buy? Kind of the standard answer for wet plate, uh, which I think probably the majority of people using strobes end up picking up on, is the Speedatron black line system. Now, High-powered pack and head systems tend to be very expensive. Speedatrons are also very expensive when they're brand new. However, this product line is basically older than God. You know, you can find these in just huge numbers on the used market where they go for much more reasonable prices than what you would pay new. For that reason, in the United States at least, where there's a good supply of them, I think Speedatron is generally going to be your go-to for higher powered lights for wet plate photography. Now that's not the only option. Uh, Profoto and Broncolor also make very high powered back and head systems, but if you're using Profoto or Broncolor, you don't need me to tell you about strobes. Those are very high end, very expensive systems. I have seen some older LM Chrome packs and heads that go up to, I believe, up to 4,000 watt seconds. I'm not sure how common those are. I don't think I've ever seen one in a used listing, but I have seen them in use. Uh, Norman also makes, I believe, some packs that go up to about 4,000 watt seconds. Those are going to be less expensive than Speedatrons, but the trick is finding them. 
the availability of them on the used market just is not as high as the speedotrons, which is why I tend to go for these instead. Now, which speedotrons should you get? There's two, of course, parts of the back and head system, the pack and the head. Let's talk about the packs first. The only two lines of Speedotron packs that I would consider for wet play photography are the 2403 line and the 4803 line. They have a bunch of smaller packs which are not going to really give you any more power than a higher model light would give you, so I don't think they're really worth considering for wet play. Um, basically the 2403 line are a set of power packs that can charge up to 2400 watt seconds. The 4803 line like the one that we see here, goes up to 4,800 watt seconds. So it's as much power as two 2403 packs. Now, at the same time, they have two basic lines of lamp heads, all right? So they have one series that can do up to 2,400 watt seconds of power, one series that can do up to 4,800 watt seconds of power. I would recommend, oh, sorry, there's one more thing about the packs, they, come in both CX and non-CX versions. So this is the 4803 CX. There is also a pack that's just called the 4803. The CX versions are just the newer versions of the packs. I've used both the originals and the newer ones interchangeably. Um, there's not a whole lot of difference between them. They have the same power levels. They have the same connections for lamp heads. The big difference is that the CX models, they're newer, they are less likely to fail on you just by virtue of not being as old. Um, Speedotron will still service them because they're currently, uh, you know, they're a current product. And they also automatically empty the capacitors when you turn them off, which just makes it slightly less likely that you will electrocute yourself while disconnecting the lamps. So, the 2403CX, you know, the 2403 or the 2403CX is probably going to be your go-to if you're kind of stretching your budget and just trying to get your first relatively affordable set of lights for wet plate. However, if you can afford it, I would go for the 4803 line. The reason being that, well, the 4803 pack has the same amount of power as two 2403 packs. And you can use it basically the same way that you would use two 2403 packs because it has plenty of connections on the front for a whole bunch of lamp heads. Pretty much more than you're going to be using for wet plate. You cannot use two 2403 packs the same way that you would use one 4803 pack. The reason for that is that the 4803 pack has everything that the 2403 has, but it also has something special, which is this high powered connector on the right hand side, which is used exclusively to connect to the higher powered heads that do 4,800 watt seconds in a single flash. The, um, you know, the 2403 line just does not have those connections, so you can't use it with those higher powered units. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look now at flash heads. But first, I'm going to take a brief pause here to reset the cameras. Now, when it comes to flash heads, um, as far as flashes that can be used for with a single pack, Speedotron basically has two tiers. Now, all these flash heads, they have a model number that has three digits. And in that three-digit model number, the first digit basically just tells you which generation it belongs to and the last digit tells you how powerful it is. So what I have right here is a Speedotron 102 head. Now this is a very old unit, but they still make them, which is nice because I prefer to stick to buying current Speedotron products because I know that I'm not gonna have a problem finding replacement parts, okay? Now the 102, uh, the one tells you what generation it's from. So this is an older style of unit. The two at the end tells you this is a 2400 watt second head. So if you have a 2403CX, you can power one of these at full power and dump the entire contents of the pack in one flash. If you have a 4803 pack, you can drive two of these at full power at the same time. 
Uh, you can also split the power a couple of different ways between them, depending on which ports on the front to plug them into. Now, I also have here, oh, and these, these are dirt cheap, by the way. There are so many of these out there in the used market. Um, I would never pay more than $100 for these. I think the cheapest I've gotten one was about $40 in perfectly good working condition. So these are very plentiful, very affordable units. This is also a 2400 watt second unit. This is the 206 VF. Now, the 2 in the model number tells you that this is a newer unit, and the VF is added to the end, stands for variable focus. So this is a unit that has this kind of big geared wheel on the back, which is what reflectors attach to. So basically this gives you the ability to zoom your reflector in and out by adjusting the position of the flash bulb inside the dish. You know, as we turn this wheel, the flash goes farther and farther back into the reflector dish. Personally, I would never spend the extra money on one of these unless you have, for some reason, a very particular need to zoom your reflectors in and out. Um, these cost more money than the 102 heads. Power-wise, they're exactly the same, and I think for the vast majority of people, functionally, they're totally equivalent. The only reason that I own this one is because a friend gave me a really good deal on his old Speedatron kit, and this was included with everything else. So that's the 102 and the two. Oh, you know what? This is not. This is not the 202. This is the 206 VF. So this is the 202 VF. You know, it looks basically the same as the 206 VF. Uh, this is the one that I would not buy. Now there is a head called the 106. All right, and that is a 4800 watt second head that looks basically the same as the 102 head. I don't buy those because they are now discontinued by Speedatron, which means that it just may not be as easy to find flash bulbs for them in the future. So I like to stick to the newer version, the 206 VF, which also has this ring that you can use to zoom in and out, which I have never used. But this is a 4800 watt second unit. Uh, this is the current well, this is the current highest powered head that Speedatron sells that you can use with a single pack. Now, there is another, another Speedatron head. I don't recall the name of it off the top of my head. They make a quad tube head which can drive up to 9600 watt seconds of power. Uh, you can plug four separate 2403 packs into it. Uh, but those are a really specialty item that you're not going to find easily in the used market. So these are kind of the typical flashes. Now what can you do with these? With a 2400 watt second head, you're golden for using, a, um, for using a beauty dish for portraiture. Beauty dish with one or even two or three people, no problem. Uh, beauty dish with a grid on it to do kind of, kind of moodier, more emotional portraiture with one person, still no problem. Um, I think when I use a beauty dish with a grid, I'm usually at a little under 2400 watt seconds on my main light, so that's still well within the range of what you can do with a 102 head. Um, soft boxes are a little bit more complicated of a story. With either of these heads, I would want to take the internal baffle out of a stop, uh, sorry, out of a soft box because they just they eat a lot of like a lot of light. Uh, 102 and a small or even a medium soft box, you may be able to pull off. It's, it's not undoable, but you're going to need a fast lens, good chemistry, and you're going to be pushing it a little bit. With a 4800 watt second head, uh, you're going to be good for, you know, small to medium soft box, no problem. So in my opinion, the 4800 watt second light is ideal to have on hand as you know, kind of your go-to main light for clothing and portraiture. And then I also like to have a couple of 102s handy to use for background lights, hair lights, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing about the 102 is that if you are going to use it with a softbox, 
there's nothing stopping you from, if you have, you know, say C stands with a good grip arm on them, just shoving two 102 heads into the same softbox, which can be kind of a budget alternative to using a 206 head if those are all that you have, or if you don't have a 4803 pack to drive a more powerful head. So that's kind of the basics of the Speedotron black line from the perspective of wet plate photography. Now, Speedotron also makes lower power packs. Uh, but I just don't think those are relevant to wet plate. If you are shooting wet plate and you're buying Speedatron, you're probably buying it for the power. So let's talk about how to actually buy these and what you should be looking at paying. Now, for context, I don't think I've bought any of this equipment in the last six months or so. So prices may have changed somewhat from what I'm gonna describe here, but I would assume that they're gonna be in roughly the same range if you're willing to wait. So basically, how much you're going to pay for a Speedotron kit depends on how long you're willing to wait for it. You know, on the, on the one end of that spectrum, if you need your kit now, you can head over to B&H, you can plunk down three grand for a 4803 CX pack, drop 600 bucks on a 206 VF head, and they'll ship that sucker out to you just as fast as they can. But if you're willing to spend a little bit of time uh, keeping an eye on used listings, you can potentially score a much better deal. So I think just about all of my Speedotron equipment I have bought off of eBay. Um, some of those come from Craigslist. You know, you would think that, uh, especially since I've been buying a lot in Los Angeles, you would think that Craigslist would be like a really good spot for me. But honestly, I just don't see a lot of the higher end Speedotron gear show up there. You know, I see a lot of smaller packs and like 102 heads, but if you're looking for like 2403, 4803 packs, even in that larger market, I haven't had a lot of good luck on Craigslist. Uh, so eBay has usually been my go-to, even with the shipping fees. Um, you know, so what I do is I just set alerts on eBay and on Craigslist for the thing that I'm looking for. And then I keep my eye out over a period of months for the best deal I can find. And those deals can be good sometimes. Uh, so for 2403 CX packs, I think I have paid anywhere from about 220 to about $300 for a pack, which is of course a lot less than you would pay brand new from a retailer like B&H. And those were in good working order. For 4803 packs, and I'm talking specifically 4803, not 4803 CX. These are older packs, kind of beat up. I have paid, I believe, I think one I got for about 420, one I got for around like 320 or 340, which is a very low price, you know, compared to even what you would probably find on eBay right this second. But if you wait around and you don't mind taking a slightly beaten up older unit, you can get a pretty good deal on it. Now the most I've ever paid for a pack is probably this one sitting right in front of you. This is a 4803 CX, I think I paid about 700 bucks for this. It's the most I've ever spent on one piece of lighting equipment. I wasn't particularly happy about it, but I wanted to get up and shooting in a new location pretty quickly, so I swallowed the price and I just bought what was on eBay at the time. Um, that being said, if you really want the CX unit, you're probably going to be looking at somewhere in that price range. For heads, you know, the 102 you should find cheap and plentiful. Uh, 102s, try not to pay more than $100 for them. I don't think you should ever have to. Cheapest I've ever paid is probably $40. Um, most expensive, I've probably paid like $50 or $60 for them before. They're all over eBay. If you don't see one right now and you go looking for it, just set an alert and wait. They'll pop up. Um, 202s, I don't even know the price of because I just, I don't see much of any purpose in buying them. They're effectively the same as the 102, but more expensive. Now the 206 is gonna be a little bit pricier, but if you are willing to wait, you can potentially find a good deal. So my target when I buy these on eBay is to spend no more than 300 or a little bit more than 300 on them, and I've usually been able to make that target. You will occasionally find these in particular with missing pieces. So the 206, unlike the 102, has a detachable power cable. Sometimes you'll find them selling you know, without the cable or potentially without a flash tube. 
be very careful about buying these piecemeal. Because, you know, I think I bought one once for $200 and it was missing its power cable and I thought I got a great deal. Then I went and looked up what a new power cable cost. And I believe they run about $160. So on that one, I actually came out overall higher than I would normally expect to pay for one of these. Flash tubes as well are very pricey. Uh, I think a 102's flash tube will run you, I think, a little over $100. And a 206 flash tube is going to be up around like $200. They're, they're very expensive. So if possible, I would try to get these used in working condition. You know, if you have to start replacing parts as soon as you buy the unit, it's going to have to be it's going to have to be at a very low price to make that worth your money. And also the power cables for the 206, they are a special order at pretty much every photo retailer. So if you buy one missing a power cable, you're going to probably have to wait a couple weeks to get one in stock. And that is my brief buyer's guide to the Speedatron Blackline for wet plate photography. So I know this has been a little bit of a long video, um, covered a lot of ground. Hopefully, if you are interested in strobes for wet plate photography, this has given you, you know, something of an idea of where to start, what to look at, and how much you should be looking to spend. So if you have any questions or any suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And until the next time, happy shooting!